Welcome to the Life Links Podcast, a Latina podcast for the modern cultura. I'm your host, Consuelo Crosby, Peruana, California native, structural engineer, mother, and your amiga for all things Latina. Here we honor the women who navigate multiple cultures, both aquí and allá, and somewhere in between, providing that safe place for you to speak your truth, celebrate la cultura, and find belonging in this comunidad. Join us every Wednesday on your favorite streaming platform to listen to your new amigas as they share their journeys of lessons learned, barriers they overcome, and the joys of living life with pure authenticity. Encuentras your voice and discover the life meant for you. Hola, chicas. Soy Consuelo here, welcoming you to the Lifelinks podcast on one of those days that I just go, hmm, what is this a sign of? It is our 111th podcast episode, 111, on October 11th. And for those of you who have been listening for a minute now, you know that 1111, that's my number. That's my game changer. So I feel like something big may be blowing in this gorgeous autumn air. I know it could have been November 11th, but that'd be forced. Not going to do that. Now, I know Melissa Sandoval, founder of Intuition Cafe, a company that we've had on for the last couple of weeks, she would have a feeling her intuition is definitely kicking up because she started her company on 11-22-2022. It's all about the numbers here. Am I right? Now, today's episode is totally enthralling. I did not see this coming. I did not see it coming in the book. I did not see it coming in conversation with the award-winning author. But you can tell. From here until we get to the very end of the episode, my voice gets higher and higher pitched because I am having more and more fun and getting utterly excited and just wanting to hop in a plane to go see our guest in person. You will laugh, you will cry, you will want to run to purchase the book so you too can live it through your own experiences. Today, we are honored to have Yasmin Ramirez award-winning author of Andale Prieta, a love letter to my family, as she reveals an even deeper story of her memoir with her abuelita, Ita. This is the story behind the story, the chance to get to know Yasmin deeper so that her memoir is less about memories to you as the reader and more about conversation with your new amiga as she shares her soulful relationship with her Ita. Yasmin Ramirez is a 2021 Martha's Institute of Creative Writing Author Fellow, as well as a 2020 recipient of the Woody and Gail Hunt Aspen Institute Fellowship Award. Now, if that wasn't enough, as author accolades go, she is also a tenured associate professor of English and creative writing and Chicanx literature at El Paso Community College. And her first published book, her memoir, on the Le Prieta, published by Lee and Low Books, is out there for you now to get both in hard copy and audiobook. And another sign, just saying, October, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is really important in our cultura, because often this is a conversation that our mothers, our mamas, our abuelitas for sure don't usually engage in sharing with us daughters and how important it is for us to have that information and knowledge. And we take that deep here in this episode because it is prevalent in Andale Prieta. You're going to love this one. Have you thinking about your own experiences with your abuelitas? I think it's just going to pull you in. So let's get on with it. So welcome to the show, Yasmin. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have you here after reading your brilliant book, Andale Prieta. And we'd like to learn more about you and everything that came into this first book published. Congratulations on that. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be here, have this conversation with you. 
Yeah, let's have that deep dive. Great conversation that we can learn who you are in your authentic self and also what you're going to give to all our listeners because many can relate to what you've been through. So why don't you share a little bit about your heritage? So I am a Mexican-American. I've lived on the border plex most of my life. I was away for a little while. My family has all been in the area for quite some time. I managed to trace back my heritage to, I think it's fourth gen, the late 1800s. And I think it's because it's a nice blend of still being able to hang on to our culture, but it's American at the same time. Beautiful story. Yeah. For those of us not in El Paso, Texas is huge. El Paso, you say, is on the border. Uh, what was it like for you growing up to be from this beautiful heritage of Mexican-Americans and yet so close to just being right there with Mexico? For me, it was completely normal to be able to cross over uh, to Juarez, which is a bordering city, and grab lunch or do some grocery shopping or get freshly made tortillas and then just walk back across. And at that point in my childhood, you would just have to walk across and say American, and then they would just let you go by. You didn't need a passport. Oh, you, wow. When I was a little bit older, like a teenager, I just yeah. needed a driver's license and I could show them my Texas driver's license. So it was really fluid in going back and forth. It was nice because it was cheaper. So you would go and have like this amazing extravagant lunch. Mm -hmm. It seemed so normal. And then when I went away to college, that's when I realized that it was not normal and that people didn't go to another country to grab some freshly made tortillas. <laughs> For lunch. <laughs> For lunch. <laughs> yeah. Quick. Can you run to the store across the border because we're out? Yes. Yeah. So it was really beautiful in this sort of innocence that I didn't realize this was not normal. So you really did have an innocent and free childhood with that. So where did you go to college that put the kibosh on that innocence? <laughs> <laughs> I moved to central Texas. I went to Denton, which is uh, like 40 minutes north of Dallas to the University okay. of North Texas. So I got plucked <laughs> sort of in this very suburban neighborhood. Oh. Um, and so it was it was really interesting just in a big shift. That I think that's the first time I actually felt like here in El Paso, I knew I was kind of morenita and pretita and it was fine because there was there's so many of us and then there's so many shades within that range from like the lightest to people that were darker than me that it was completely normal. But when I got to North Texas and I'm in college classes and then I realized there was not a lot of people who looked like me, that's the first time I truly felt like very brown. And it was a weird feeling to constantly be explaining who I was um, or what I was, because that was really where the questions would come from. Where are you from? Where are your parents from? And then I just learned, oh, I know what you really want to know. Oh, <laughs> no. Yeah. Constantly, constantly. Oh, that's wicked. It was exhausting, actually. Now that I think about it, it was exhausting. But in in that point, I just didn't know any better. You know, I'm like a 20, 21 year old kid. Yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know where El Paso is. What do you mean? You've never met a Mexican person because to them I was Mexican. But I'm not, but I am, but I'm not. <laughs> there is the crux. There is the crux of the whole purpose of this podcast is that yes. where are we on that? <laughs> where are we on that cusp of you're here and you're there? And it's, it doesn't even get to like how you feel inside it doesn't even cut to your soul like how you identify it doesn't matter where you were born or where you lived it's just you have that feeling did it ever stop during college or did you just go you know what you know <laughs> it did not stop it didn't stop and then even then when I got done with college I stayed in the Metroplex for a while I lived there for in its entirety from oh. start to finish I was there for a decade of my life so when I moved closer to Dallas, away from sort of a college city or college town, it didn't stop. Uh, and then I worked high in retail where I think there are certain molds that people fit into. 
And that was also odd because I would get asked really odd questions like where I was from. And then I would say and they would say, oh, we thought you were Indian because you spoke English. So there was all these preconceived ideas that they were trying to slot you into based on their limited exposure to any kind of diversity. Yes, absolutely. And then they didn't realize what they were saying was truly offensive because then what they're saying is, oh, you couldn't be Mexican because you speak English well. So no one ever bothered to say, who are you? It was always, what are you? Absolutely. Yes. It was always, what are you? I have to say, and I I don't even know if I realized I was doing this, but I was slowly like assimilating. Um, And there was something really simple that happened in that, not that my Spanish has ever been amazing because I grew up speaking English first and then Spanish was just mixed in there. But the longer I was there, the more I lost my Spanish. From lack of speaking to anyone, you think? More than trying to assimilate, maybe. Yes. From lack of speaking to anyone. But then later, um, like I've had conversations with people now who are Latine and they're like, oh, but there was this like Hispanic association on campus. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. And Mm. it was more out of lack of knowledge and that I was just trying to keep my head up and pass my classes and then later work and pay my bill that I didn't seek out a network. And in the bubbles I was in, I didn't encounter a lot of other Latina people. Mm -hmm. And so I was just kind of like, okay, I was always the only brown person with a bunch of white people. (laughs) Another common thread. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And so it was just odd. And I think I just Mm. learned to fit in those spaces. One of the things that I laugh at it now, when I first moved back to El Paso, and I wrote about this in the book, I went to get my oil changed because I'd just driven 12 hours and so many, many miles. So, you know, after I slept, I was like, let me go do this. And I went to a mechanic shop here and I started asking like, okay, yes. And they're like, your name? And I was like, Yasmin, (laughs) Y-A-S-M-I-N, Ramirez, R-A-M-I-R. And then they just looked at me and I was all, I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm the Ramirez. <laughs> and you don't need to spell it. Thank you. And yes, I did not need to spell it at all. Because I heard in, in the Metroplex, I heard my last name uh, butchered so many times. And then also mm. they would say my name, Yasmin. So I wasn't Yasmin there. I was Yasmin. And it would be like Ramirez, Ramrez, just that every, <laughs> every yeah. mispronunciation that you could imagine. And so there was little things like that that I learned even to anglicize my name so that oh, other people would understand it. Oh, dang. Yeah, that's that's really a deep I, level conversation yes, yeah. of where do you come from? What are you? All that. But oh, my gosh. Yeah. Do you think also when assimilation that let me just avoid that conversation, I just want to be me in my space. I'm trying to go through what is for everyone a really difficult period in adulting. And here you have this barrage of what are you, not even who are you. Did that maybe hit back on the little Yasmin, the little one who was trying to shrink in her kindergarten class so as not to cause trouble? Did that feel like the same scenario? You know, I think that's a that's a beautiful analogy because I think it was. I didn't realize it was happening, but it definitely was me trying to shrink to fit in in this space as best as I could and not draw attention to myself. Because if I drew attention to myself, then I would have to explain things. And that was exhausting and then also infuriating at the same time, because I would say things like, well, my mom was born in the United States. What about your grandmother? Like they were just really trying. And I would say she was born in El Paso, too. And then they would just kind of look at me oh, wicked. like they didn't believe me. And so I think that also serves to this narrative that outside of border cities or where there's high population um, of diverse groups that mm-hmm. we're all immigrants, right? There's this belief that we all just suddenly <laughs> arrived here like Thanos <laughs> and all the immigrants were here. Um, but, <laughs> but the truth is, is we've yeah. been here for a very long time. But there's a sort of disbelief that happens. And so that was also like, now I have to prove myself? Like, what's going on? It's easier if I just shrink away from my own identity and my own personality in order not to have people wanting an explanation or 
wanting you to fit in. Right. So both through the book and in conversation with you, you are a very strong woman. You're a very strong personality. Um, You've grown into the, to me, from just very limited exposure, uh, hey, this is just the way it is kind of person. Do you remember a moment when that really started coming out and saying, you know, I love who I am and and I'm putting myself out there loud and proud. There was a trigger for sure. And then it was sort of like dominoes falling after that. And I would have to say it started all with the passing of my grandmother. So when she died, I had like this cosmic shift in my life and I started to reevaluate what was really important. And working high end retail, I just started to get really, I don't want to say bitter, but I think that's the closest thing. I was just looking at people and looking at the company asking me like, oh, you need to sell more. And I was yeah. just like, really? This, this is what's important. Um, and so th- I think that's when I started to really reevaluate and think, what is important to me and who do I want to be? Because I didn't like who I was at that point getting up and working crazy shifts and going to happy hour. And granted, I think the twenties <laughs> are the happy hour era for, for most people. <laughs> um, yes. If it's done right, your twenties are for happy hours and going to work. But I just didn't like any of that anymore. Sure. And then when I moved back to El Paso uh, for grad school, I accidentally fell into this perfect uh, incubator for myself because the MFA, which is a master's in fine arts, creative writing program I was in, that was bilingual. So they let in five Spanish speakers. And when I say Spanish, it was uh, people from Colombia, mm. uh, El Salvador, Mexico, Venezuela, and then they let in five English speakers. And so each cohort was half and half. Oh, that's brilliant. Yes. Uh, and when I got back, I was just thrown into that. <laughs> which was shocking. I felt like I'd just been thrown into the deep end. And I remember I looked at my syllabus and it was all in Spanish and I freaked out. So I think that first semester, my poor mother, she took creative writing with me because I would have to read stories in Spanish. And then also it was a different kind of Spanish that I grew up with because I grew up with border Spanish, which Mm -hmm. is the mix that isn't, you know, even like if I go to the F, it's a completely different Spanish. So I'm reading like Colombian Spanish to my mom in the kitchen. I'm like reading out loud and then she would hear me say something and she'd be like, wait, stop, go back. What was that word? And I'm like, (laughs) so I would read a paragraph and then summarize it for her. Because I, the other thing is I was never taught to write in Spanish and I was never taught to read in Spanish. It's just where I grew up. So it was all phonetic. Pure communication, conversational style. Yes. So... But within that incubator, it was fun because then I got to discover or rediscover, I should say, like my Latinidad. And I was in this very safe space. Because that must have always been pulsing inside of you and just had no place for it. When I think back on grad school, one, it was, again, like full of creativity and learning. And then I think of having like asadas and hanging out and mingling and trying to practice my Spanish and being in this safe space where we would laugh when I mispronounced something, but it was a, we would laugh, Mm -hmm. not I was laughed at, or I was learning new words that were not like my border Spanish words. It was really, really lovely. Let's go back to that trigger point because this is really the core. She is the sun in your world. She is the main component of your memoir and everything that brought your life forward, your abuelita, Ita, please, for the listeners, describe who she is for you. She's so much. She's like multiple things. My childhood, my Ita was my safe space. Not that I ever felt unsafe, but it was just like this comforting space that I was always in. And we were like watching TV or we were out and I did grow up going to bars because she used to be a bartender, but even in the bars, I never felt unsafe. In fact, I felt like doted on because the adults would buy me papitas and things and here's some quarters for the jukebox. And it was just so much fun. As I got older, she was this compass, right? Of not who I wanted to be exactly, but how I wanted to be. And she didn't give up on things. And she, if if one thing didn't work one way, she went another direction and she learned to pivot. And I think that's 
her tenacity is something that I carry with me. And so when I think of her, I think of being nurtured. I think of being entertained because I also think how tiresome must I have been like a six-year-old kid bugging her all the time and like, <laughs> ita, 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 ita. she's an adult, you know, <laughs> like, aha, <laughs> which is very evident. Um, You're very truthful about that. In your yeah. She was just this beautiful, steady, even when I wasn't in contact with her, you know, and then when I suddenly she's gone, she passed away in her sleep. And not that I would have preferred like she died, you know, with a long illness, but then you're kind of prepared. So we were just really completely unprepared for this to happen. And so then there's this moment where I felt not only an overwhelming grief, but also this overwhelming guilt because I felt like I'd wasted time and I didn't take care of her and I didn't check on her enough. There's like Mm -hmm. the would have, would have, would have. I hear you. Mm hmm. And so when I started writing the memoir, it was, well, one, it was for me. I never said, I'm going to write a book about my Itha. It was for me to hang on to the memories I had of her because I felt like this is all I have left. If I don't document this, I'm going to forget this also. And that's how it started. Itha. I love Itha. The title of the book, Andale Prieta. Explain the title and what it means for you and why is it the title of your memoir? So I have to be honest and say that it was not the original title, but in working with Cinco Puntos Press and Lee Bird, who was my press before they were sold to Lee and Lo, mm-hmm. um, she pointed out that there's like three quintessential points in the book where Ita says like, andale prieta. And she's actually the one who pitched to me, like, what if we name it this? I was like, oh, wow. I got like a little bit nervous because I I didn't know how that would work. And I was thinking of people not being able to pronounce Prieta. And then, (laughs) and then I thought, but wait, this is really beautiful because I'm, I'm in the title, right? Me, because I'm Prieta. And then my Ita is also represented because she's saying, andale Prieta. And then when that sort of came together in my mind, I was like, yes, okay, let's do it. It seemed the perfect title. And now I've seen what's come from the title. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most beautiful things is fellow like Prietas and Morenitas and Negritas reaching out to me and sharing not only their experience with the book, but when they first saw the title and so what they thought and how they felt. And so that has been really beautiful because there's been a common thread in that we've all felt very alone in those moments of our skin tone. And then we realized that we all felt very much the same. And that has been amazing to hear and share and know that that simple sort of decision that came up of like, we should name it this, okay, uh, has had such an impact. That you could never have planned for or expected. No, and that's how I feel so silly that I didn't think about that. Because really I was just thinking about myself and my Itha now there's the other topics that have come up of colorism and and what it means to be called prieta and whether it's a good word or a bad word or and how I've taken ownership of the word. Yeah, but also again, why it's imperative to have this narrative, the Latina narrative, in a true authenticity, not muted, let alone silenced, but not softened to be palpable to the everyday reader, but just out in the hard truth, because you don't, if you haven't experienced it in your lifetime, realize the impact and the solace you are providing for people you don't know. And yet there is the comunidad, right? There is the, yes, you belong. Yes, I hear you. Me too. Now, Prieta, We want to explain a little bit more for the listeners. What is it describing for a person? Not literally, but the person. At its most basic level, it's skin color, Mm -hmm. right? But I think it depends on who it's coming from. And I think that's where I've gotten people share things. So I was lucky enough that Prieta, for me, came from a place of love. Mm -hmm. Like an endearment. Yes, it was an endearment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And... In in hindsight, I can see that she was trying to teach me how to appreciate my skin color and how to feel comfortable in it. Because I was always like, Prieta linda. (laughs) I wasn't, you know, like, (laughs) yeah, Yeah. it was always said with cariño, always said with love. And 
I think where the pitfall is, is that it's not always used that way within mm-hmm. the community. It goes back to colonization mm-hmm. of like mejorando la raza. Mm-hmm. Of the closer you are in proximity to whiteness, mm-hmm. the more socially acceptable you are, the prettier you are, yeah. the, da, 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 the more the, elite, right? the more, yeah. yeah, the more you're not who you are. Exactly. And so, but I didn't have any of that. Yeah. I, I didn't realize it until later. And so I have that foundation of Prieta Linda, mm-hmm. right? And Prieta. And I hope that in using the word, it, especially how I've taken ownership of it, others will too. And they'll feel that strength in, in community of being Prietitas and being Morenitas. I find it beautiful and I celebrate my color whenever I can. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. That's a beautiful sentiment to put out there worldwide. Because if you only had heard it as a derogatory term, it must be difficult, like beyond difficult. It must be just torturing to tear open into your identity and embrace if all you've known up to that point is derogatory. And yet you hear someone where they're coming from a place of love. And what a safe pool to dive into. It's like, oh, it's a loving term. You know, Yasmin's going to love me for being the Prieta because you know, she understands where it comes from. So even when you were exposed to, oh, there's a nastier side to this term, by then you were well nurtured and knowing of this love. Like, no, you're not coming here with that. Like, <laughs> Yes, especially now in adulthood, I'm very OK with it. Teen Yasmin sometimes was insecure. Yeah. Um Right. But every yep. teen is insecure. Everybody. So I don't blame teen Yasmin for any of that. I have this wonderful story. I was in Santa Marta in Colombia because my husband's Colombian and we were there and we were getting on a boat to be taken to an island. And so we have our little life jackets on and we're getting in and these two women turned to me and they were Argentinian and they were like, we it is bien prieta. And they said it with the toe. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, we're and I remember thinking like, we're at the beach. Like in the sun. And so I just looked at them and I was like, gracias. <laughs> and so they look so shocked. Yes. <laughs> that I was like, there's thank you. That, there's a generations of strong women coming out. <laughs> definitely in your retelling of her life and your experiences with her, definitely a very strong woman, very, very protective. Your abuelita, Ita. She is your protector, both in ways like teaching you how to box, teaching you how to protect yourself, not take crap from anybody. But it's very obvious she's also very tender that she's had to put up this exterior for good reason in her life experiences. But she does have a tenderness about her. Do you have one of those memories of seeing that really tender side? You know, I have the it's not in the book. But I have this memory when I was, uh, I think I was like seven. I was really silly. I got on top of a desk, like a school desk. Okay. But on the desk writing part and didn't think I would fall. Oh, gosh. So when I fell, the desk fell on my leg, on my Ow. shin bone. Ow. So I had it for years. I had a huge dent. Ow. Like I didn't break anything. Ouch. I didn't, nothing happened, like, but it just dented my body. And I remember when we would watch TV, I would often like stretch my legs out across her. And she would like so bad and so bad like my calf to try to like get the dent out. Oh, um, you know, there's so much going on there, right? There, but that's one of my prettiest memories with my Ita. And I like now I have like the slightest of, like I know it's there. No one can see it, mm-hmm. but I know that I don't have a giant dent on my leg <laughs> because she would just you know rub my shin. Yeah, the massaging the bone to heal back together a little bit more. Oh, sweetness. In your ita, 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 it's very apparent you're a very curious, very observant little girl because you're starting this memoir. You are a little, little girl. And uh, you express throughout it beautifully that you're very calm and observant, whether it's about the bars she's taking you out to, the friends that you wonder about, how long have they been together, uh, her ex-husbands and 
Then it comes down to the scars that you see on her body and very contemplative, very curious. Is that your personality in general that you just wanted to know? Because I was always a child in an adult world, there wasn't a lot for me to do other than read, which I did a lot of, and I would take books with me. But then sometimes I would get tired of reading, so I would people watch. And I found people very fascinating. And I think growing up the way I did made me very intuitive to like body language and tone and how things are said. And I find that all very fascinating. To this day, I love people watching. Me too. Yeah. So I, and I think that's where I learned it. And then also I'm very visual. And so if I see something, one flash of a moment, then it kind of stays with me and I can't let it go for a little while. And sometimes it stays with me forever, or sometimes I use one little piece of something to create a story, but I feel like my brain almost takes like photographs and I hang on to them when I find something really, really fascinating. That becomes your memory. It's actually the vision rather than maybe people retelling the experience Mm -hmm. because it definitely comes through in your beautiful writing. The descriptions are very, very different than I've read in the past. Throughout the book, I was wondering, and also applauding, that this is why it's really important to have the diversity in authors, because how you express yourself, yes, it is you personally, you are very unique, but there's definitely the Latina dad coming through. Well, like in the wow. description of the scars, Anita, now we're going to go deep with Ita. <laughs> I really resonate a lot with your Ita and my mother. I feel like if someone else had been going through that description, it would have been more medical. It would have been more purpose driven. It would have been more explanation. This is why it happened and done. And instead, you're describing her life experience through them. Even the concept is something that, like you say, you're observant with people. It's more that, you know, there's also the cultura loves people. They want to know why, not what or how. And throughout your book, you seem to explain your situation through your mother, your father, your, your abuelita, in a sense of explaining who they are versus what they did. That's really powerfully different. I don't know if if any other culture would have the closeness of, you know, me just going to the bathroom. I'm trying to pee and my grandma's taking a bath in front of me and she's completely nude and she, Mm -hmm. you know, not trying to hide herself, Mm -hmm. Um, which I think that's also what I found really beautiful. And I grew up in a household of women who didn't hide themselves. That was really beautiful. And seeing her, I don't know, the care that she took of herself, even though she was, you know, scarred in so many ways. Had you realized at that point exactly what you had written? Because it is an expose on you and the women in your family. And now you have to market that. Had you thought about that before? No. (laughs) I had it. Did you do that? I I did. I did. I have I have a funny story. Um, Like the week before it came out, I had um, the press sent me my copies and you open a book. And I'd already done research on social media to see what kind of posts authors were doing. And I was doing market research, I guess you could say. And I knew that I had to open the box and do the unveiling. And I did the video. Uh, And then I sat down and I was like looking at the book. And then I realized like, oh, wow, wait, this is going to be out like out there and I told my husband like holy shit everyone's gonna know about my life and he started laughing and he said yes me you just thought about this. it's a little late it's going on the shelves yes and so then it sunk in and then I had this like oh, oh god moment but then I was like well yeah okay it's done oh my god you just had to remove yourself at that point like But, you know, that's probably your brain taking over, too, because your soul wrote that whole book. Your soul in relationship to Ita. Oh, my goodness. That came out in black and white. 
uh, on the pages. So it is your brain kicking in with the, oh, what will people think? Oh, well. Yes. Yeah. It was definitely my brain just sort of, what, what happened? What are you doing? Um, <laughs> the small panic. Too late. But late. it's amazing that the brain did not kick in and prevent you from writing that during all that time. Because there was opportunity for you to have that aha moment and, and say, well, no, this is just for me. This is my memoir with Ita. I'll keep it for myself. I think, too, it, it was the storyteller in me because I was trying and this is something I was conscious of while I was writing in that I knew I wanted to follow certain stories that would give a clear story without sharing unnecessary bit. Mm -hmm. And so everything in the book is very necessary to show who we were and who we are. Um, and so when I was in those moments, I did the thing like horses, I put blinders on because if I thought about the audience, I don't think I could have written a half of what I wrote, I would have been too afraid of what people would think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which culturally, we're raised in that a lot. We are filtered before we even leave the house of what to say, how to act, what to wear, you know, who to be seen with, all of it. It's like, oh. So again, the authenticity of your book is so much more powerful to a, the entire culture of Latinas some presses, for example, still want to like italicize Spanish, which oh, do we have to do we have to do that? No, <laughs> because it's different. Should be noted. Yes, because it's different. Yes, but it's othering the language. Yeah, right, right. And so for me, with Ana de Prieta, a point that I would not budge from was that Ita had to be in Spanish. There was no way I could write her in English no. because that was her. And I was lucky with Cinco Puntos Press. They were like, we love it. Just give context to people who don't speak Spanish. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. You weave it together so well, so seamlessly. You grew up with your mom and your Ita, Abuelita Ita, in the same household, kind of, because your mom was working a lot to sustain the family. But you had separate households, too. Yes generationally seem to be <laughs> immensely strong women just throughout your life. Did you see that as your role model? Is this who I'm supposed to grow up into? Or did you see them more as for your mom, she was the disciplinarian and for your, your Ita, she was the protector. And that allowed you to be who you were born to be. I don't know. I think it's a little bit of both in that my Ita provided this safe space for me and there were certain things I knew I was expected to be able to do, especially from my mom. This did not come from my Ita. My mom was like, you know, you can't always rely on other people. Expect them to let you down. So you need to be able to do this. So like by the time I was 16, I knew how to change a tire. Things like that my mom taught me because she's like, you can't rely on someone else to do this for you. And so I remember... I taught my boyfriend how to change the tire at a <laughs> gas station. And it was funny because he didn't believe me. And it turned into this weird dynamic because then he asked an older man that was there and he's like, she's right. So there's things that I was like, ah, yeah, my mom's right. You know, I can't always rely on another person to help me. That was something I had repeated to me a lot. I was still growing up. I was developing. That definitely was a marker that sort of changed who I was going to be mm. and that I knew I had to be self-reliance. You touch on the relationship between your mom and Ita, but has that changed as you got older? Did you understand it better as you start nearing an age where your memoir is talking about? Do you see things differently? Uh, yes. And I think as a, even as a child, I saw things were odd and their relationship and the difficulties that they had. I didn't know what it was, um, but there was definitely some things that I just noticed and how their, I don't want to say lack of communication because they communicated, but they just didn't communicate well. They talked at each other. And then through the writing process, that's where I started to break stuff apart as I learned more, even my Ita's relationship with her mom, with my Mama Lupe, mm -hmm. and how difficult that was. And then I see the little things passed on and I don't, you know, that comes with generational, I don't want to call it trauma, mm -hmm. but 
generational lessons, right? Mm-hmm. That maybe my Etha thought this is how I have to be. She didn't have the time to self-reflect, to be, right. oh, I can break this, right? Because then she's like, I have to be the provider. I have to work. I have to take care of my kid. I am fortunate now because of all of their efforts to be able to have a moment to sit and think about that, yeah. right? To have the energy to think about it and to have the energy to think of how I want to do things differently. I don't want to be reactive. I want to be responsive. I want to listen. And even then, I still have to work on it. That is the most remarkable component to me in the book, because I was a single mom for 22 years. I raised the two on my own. And it's tough to go back and forth between being the strength, being the protector, the protector in a way that you're protecting from bad things. So that's a whole different fierceness that you put up for that. And you can't just flip into that mode of being the tender nurturer. And yet Ita tends to do that in your book and your descriptions in the she finds the fun. She finds laughter. She comes off that. OK, this is what needs to be done. OK, let's have a good time. It's like, wait, did it really happen that quickly? I think it's a huge blessing providing women in that scenario that within that strength, within that fierce protector, you also can provide your own safe place to revel and bring your tenderness forward. Oh, I love her. I love her. It was really wonderful. How do you carry her forward now? I don't know. That's a good question. I think it comes in being able to celebrate myself unapologetically. Right? Ethan never apologized for what she did. She carried scars and she, emotional scars and, and real scars, but she didn't apologize for who she was because she did the things that she needed to do. Mm-hmm. She needed to provide, she needed to take care of the family. She found jobs where she could make the most money, right? She got divorced at a time where divorce was not verboten. A thing, right? It was verboten. Yeah. Um, she was a single mother in a time where there wasn't a lot of single mothers. And so I think I've, I carry that with me and I, I need to do what's best for me. Now I have the, the privilege that they've afforded me to make decisions and choose on what's best for me and not just take what I can get kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah. so there's some beauty in that. Just by living your own authentic self, you're bringing her forward. You came back for your MFA, and this is after doing 10 years out on your own, burned out from school, went into retail, corporate, all the thing. Then, like you said, have this moment, this aha moment of, oh, my gosh, I'm just feeding my brain. I'm feeding my ego succeed on the American terms. I got to get back to my soul. Your Ita passes. Was this the segue into your writing per se, because you went into your master's? Or were you always expressing yourself in your writing throughout life? I was always expressing myself through writing. I always had a journal. One of my favorite things I used to do, and this sounds creepy, (laughs) is I would go to the food (laughs) court uh, on days that I just needed to be by myself that I wasn't eating with my, my friends and colleagues. I would write down what people were talking about because I Mm -hmm. find it fascinating what conversations people would have in public thinking that nobody was listening. Oh, And so I would put on headphones and then I would just write in my journal, but I would write kind of like what they were talking about. I didn't know this at the time, but I was learning how to write dialogue and speech pattern. I was inadvertently teaching myself how to do that, but I was just like, oh my God, they're talking about this. Yeah. And I just had to make sure I never looked over. I had to look really into my journal. <laughs> Rather than what? <laughs> and then? <laughs> wait, wait, can you repeat that? <laughs> yes, yeah. Wow. And so I would create little stories based on their mannerisms mm-hmm. and how they were dressed. I just found it really interesting. I was just having fun with it. I, I didn't know I could actually do anything with it. You're doing your own novella with the people all around you. Yes, exactly. Yes. In listening to the book, 
it feels like you're just in a room with you. It feels like you're just in conversation with us, the readers, that we're just sitting here listening to you. And we hit the pause and we do have our own response. You just miss it. But <laughs> I'm sure people are sending it to you because it really reflects immediately into our own lives. We do have the commonality. We do have the threads of experiences, either as the strong women, being the only daughter, all those components that we identify. One of the points for me, and I think this is where I want to do a deep dive because this is where I felt like, wow, we are so similar and yet we're so different. In Highland Park, you're working at a high-end retail store and you're in the department for fitting women with prosthetics who have had mastectomies. Now in the book, we know that Ita has had a mastectomy and that you were aware at a very young age that she had one. So that's a lot for a young person because even in Highland Park, you're only in your 20s. What was it like to bring that memory forward to the women that you were fitting in these prosthetics? When I started that section, I felt like I was honoring them and their stories because it's such a vulnerable place to be. And if I think back to, to like 20 something year old Yasmin, I wonder like, wow, how'd you do that? Because I don't know if I could do it now, acknowledging how vulnerable they were because I saw their vulnerability in my 20s. And the only thing I knew how to do at that point was make them feel as comfortable as possible. I, I wanted to honor their stories and what they would share with me and also what they taught me about resiliency because they would come in with their bodies scarred, some of them still healing, some of them still had drainage tubes. Oh. Um, some of them would come in like, oh yeah, I had a mastectomy years ago and I'm completely fine. And I remember one woman, she'd had a double mastectomy and she told me, you know, sometimes though, when I go running, it's just a lot easier. I just go as I am. And I remember her saying that. And I remember laughing and thinking like, I think it's beautiful that mm -hmm. she's finding this positive. I feel like in those moments, I learned to know my Ita in a different way, right? Because mm -hmm. my Ita is my Ita and she's my grandmother. But she was also a woman. She was also a mother. She was also a wife. And so in those moments, I think I was getting to know her because I knew the story from my mother of when she had breast cancer, very young at 40. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Frightening. And yeah. And how she found out about it and what happened and how she changed after. And then I would see these women. And so I couldn't help but see the connection, not just the scar, not just the mastectomy, mm -hmm. but in how they were mourning parts of their body mm -hmm. being gone and not just part of their body, what it signifies. Yeah. Their womanhood yeah. uh, is gone. Parts of it are gone. And had your Ita ever described it to you, her experience with it? She didn't really. It was more like offhand matter of fact for her of like, oh, yeah, eh, I went. And she, the way she would say it was, me quitaron la chichi. <laughs> <laughs> I love that I can laugh about that yeah. now. And and I think maybe that was just easier for her to say it that way yeah. too, right? Because yeah. then she wouldn't have to share this deep thing with me. I don't know if I was at an age that she would have, if I would have understood even if she had shared this very deep memory with me. But I saw it, you know, I saw it when she would get ready and how she would have to make sure that her, her bus line was perfect and she would double check it. And I would see it because I, I went bra shopping with her and I remember sitting on the floor in the dressing room as a woman would come in and bring her different prosthesis and you look at the weight and things like that. And then I learned more about weight and breast shape when I was doing it myself. And then also something as simple as trying to match color, right? And so there was an interesting thing where we really didn't have prosthesis mm -hmm. of different skin tones. <gasps> Um, oh, so, yeah. so when I would have, um, you know, black women come in, oh, I'm, I'm no. showing them pink. No. Oh, wicked. And I would have like one darker tone mm -hmm. prosthesis or maybe two. Mm -hmm. So I would have the special order and not that they didn't exist, but they were always more difficult to find. Mm -hmm. Those are things I didn't think of as a child when my Ita's getting fit for her prosthesis. Okay, this is where we're completely different. And I really love that we're talking about this during October when it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. My mother also had breast cancer. 
she was 35 when she got it, had a mastectomy. However, my mother was so private, so private. And I was the only girl. Maybe it was a house full of boys. I don't know. I did not know she had a prosthetic until her last year of life when I was taking care of her 24 seven. I knew she had breast cancer, but the way I found out that she had breast cancer was not even directly from her. It was through her brother who we were all sitting at a Thanksgiving dinner table together. I was shocked. I was shocked. I felt betrayed. And I felt like, again, the thought, is this the culture? Is this the culture who's like, no, we don't talk about it. You know, it's okay. It will be fine. And I'm wondering, gosh, would my friends that didn't come from the culture, would they have known? Would they have been able to protect themselves? In that regard, the women in your family were so much more open and honest. And my experience was completely different. And at that moment in the book, when I'm reading this, I felt like, gosh, you were lucky. You were lucky to know. And it played into your own life then. Yes. Yeah. That has to be so hard. And, you know, we'll never know why your mother didn't want to share that. But I do know from the women I would help is I think it's such a vulnerable place that it's almost like you have to keep it for yourself. Right. You have to protect it. For many of the listeners here, for the readers of your brilliant book, we tend to hold on to what's not right by our own terms, not getting past what's happening and what we're receiving from the person in order to understand what they may have gone through, what it was like for them in their own life, their experiences at the time they were happening. Is there um, something you could share from your own personal experience with it to help people open the door a little bit to understand who their mother or their grandmother is beyond how they act or behave? I don't know if this will work for everyone because I know this is what happened with me is that I was trying to follow the story. You know, that's me. I like to follow stories. I like (laughs) to create stories. Yes. And so I really wanted to get to know my Etha in a different way. And even to get to know my mom in a different way, as I was researching and asking my family questions and trying to figure out, you know, who she'd been married to and why or where she worked or things like that, I was like, God, I could have asked her these things. Oh, right? yeah. I, I never thought of asking her these things. And so for the non-writers, for the non-story thinkers, I think that people are willing to talk if you give them the space. And I think... I provided that space for my mom and for my sister and that I would just ask them questions and I would just listen. I had to flip a switch in my head. I had to not be a daughter Yasmin. I had to not be sister Yasmin. I had to be writer Yasmin. And I had to give them the space to, to speak freely and to for me to not comment. I mean, I could say like, oh, wow, and then? But I couldn't say things like, and you did that? Because then that's going to just, <laughs> that's going to shut things down. And cut. <clears throat> cut. <laughs> The other thing I was going to say is a meal always helps too. Food in itself is a communication form. I think over the meal, it's easier than if I sat down and I said, uh, let's have a talk and tell me about how you grew up. Oh, wow. <laughs> so true. That's why I want to do these in person. Uh, we don't do an interview style. We converse, <laughs> record us over a good time having a meal. It's really much more difficult to understand that, hey, not that long ago. Not that long ago at all, women were so severely restricted, oppressed, dismissed. In the 80s, you couldn't have a credit card. You couldn't own a company in your name. You couldn't own a land in your name. You couldn't pull a loan in your name. You had to have a male counterpart on your loan in the 80s. So can you imagine in in our own lifetime, if it's so, so different, how greatly different it must have been for our mothers and our grandmothers. We couldn't even understand the choices they made right, and the things that they did and the toll it took on them. I told you, my abuelita, she had a pistol. She had a pearl handle pistol when she was out in the country, the, the sugar cane ranch in the country. 
from my mom explaining it, how she was the only daughter who was privileged enough to go get the gun out of the carved wooden chest. Her mom trusted her with the key. Her mom trusted her to go get the gun. I was so mesmerized by that. See, I'm not the storyteller. I'm not good at paparazzi. It's just like, that was the end of the story for me. And only now I'm like, wait, why did she have to go get the gun? Why did she have the gun? I mean, that's where you need to take over. (laughs) I know, but as you were saying that, I'm like, and then I was waiting. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. And I've lost my mom. So now I really don't know why. Why did you go get the gun? What was going on at the time that you went to go get the gun? That's fascinating. You can use your creative brilliance (laughs) and and write that story. During your memoir, we get a very um, up close, very honest idea of who you are, who you've always been, your life experience. And here I hope we get a little bit more. But now tell us something, even with that knowledge we have of you, what is something we wouldn't guess about you? No one really knows this. And maybe now they will. Um, So I'm a little bit of a hippie now in that I garden and I compost. Oh, going back to um, the land. Yes. Yeah. So that's actually one of my favorite things to do. And this happened like even pre-pandemic. I was already like with my plantitas before it became trendy in in our backyard. Um, And then I started growing uh, or trying to grow my own food because I, you know, a particular skill. So I killed a lot of plants initially. (laughs) And Um, (laughs) yeah, Yes. (laughs) But now I've been composting for like five years now. I like try to be as green as possible and I make my own cleaners. I'll put infused vinegar with oranges. Like I'll use orange peel. Oh. If we have oranges, I'll save them and then I'll soak them in vinegar okay. for a couple of weeks. Okay. And then I end up with orange scented cleaner. So for cleaning, like wiping down surfaces and things. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. You took it to another level. I was going to say the young girls are going to, not that you're not young. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm older than you, but, <laughs> but I could see like when you're describing the, the composting and the gardening and them being like, oh, well, she's in her senora era. <laughs> but, but dang, taking it to a whole other level with the cleaner, that's clever. For where you are now in your very successful life, really beautiful, you've come through so much and flourishing as your authentic self. What would it be like to have Ita with you right now? I think she is with me. This is so weird and, and I'm very superstitious. Oh, yeah. I believe that she sends me little messages and I've dreamt her. And um, a lot of times at events, I feel like she's in the corner, like there. Mm -hmm. And she's very excited because I think in another life, my Ipa would have tried to be like a singer. She had a very beautiful voice. She sang all the time. She wanted to be known for that and she wanted to be remembered. And so I created this space where she is very much remembered and celebrated as a real person, though, Yeah. because I I didn't paint her perfect. Like she was a human being and and she was flawed and we all are. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think she is with me. This is a weird thing to say because selfishly I would want her with me, but I don't know if she had a not pass at that moment if I would be here. Oh. That moment was a catalyst for so much. Mm-hmm. So I might be in a completely different space if she was still alive. That's beautiful. That's brilliant. Because she was always there for you. And if she were still alive, you would be in your safe place because you had your protector. And losing that is like stripping away that security blanket. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I definitely love that you've kept her so present, so palpable. Your writing surely emboldens her as, like you say, just as her human self. Although I think she has a bit of goddess in her. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very, very much and sharing even more of yourself. But, you know, Coming to understand 
where the power of this memoir comes from, because it's not just memories. This is an empowering and bold book that you've provided for the readers. Yes, enjoyment. Yes, gratitude for you sharing, but also freedom. I really felt the freedom personally in handing it into your book. So thank you so very much for for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to carry your words because it's very beautiful on how you read the book and what you did with it because now it is your book. It's not mine. It's how you have a relationship with it. And that's very beautiful. Awesome. I can't wait for the second one. I know it's not going to be a memoir, (laughs) but I'll be looking for you and looking for all the other Latinas out there who have a story in their heart and their soul that put just put it out there, put it out there. We need to see ourselves in the mainstream, not as a collection, but just filling the shelves, right? Yes, absolutely. We need you out there. I had so much fun. (laughs) Yes, (laughs) that's what I go for. (laughs) Yes, I had a lot of fun. And I hope you had fun, too, listening to award-winning author Yasmin Ramirez as she reveals even more of her truth that manifested her memoir on the Le Prieta. How many tissues did you go through as she described her loving Ita and their soulful relationship? I was so grateful for our bouts of uncontrolled laughter, and I don't know if that was a release or if You found it as funny as we did, but ultimately so joyful in gratitude for Yasmin, slowly unwrapping the beauty of humanity, scars and all, that we can embrace and keep close to us as a sign of that love and the beauty and the honesty we can have with each other. You can find Yasmin on Instagram at Yasmin at Yasmin Ramirez writes. And her memoir is available in hardcover and audio formats. I have both because I love to immediately find a passage in the book that resonates with me, run my fingers over the words, but the audio, oh, the audio book is also so beautifully narrated. It's as though Yasmin is in the room with you. That gives it that extra deep dive into la cultura, especially when her Ita is speaking to you. You feel like she's right there. Be sure to pick up your copy so you too can make it yours, as Yasmin encourages. Now next week, we would typically have a pod club episode of what you heard here today, a synopsis to capture the gems of Yasmin's conversation as it applies to all of us. But here's the thing. The two of us talked for over two hours, and we definitely would keep going in person over the great food and bevies that we talk about. And although this episode captures the story behind her story, Yasmin also shared invaluable information about writing and publishing for all you aspiring storytellers out there. So join us next week for another episode of Yasmin Ramirez revealing her insights on getting your story out in the shelves. Remember to share this podcast with your amigas to help the comunidad grow and create a safe place of belonging where your stories resonate with each other. It is truly a life-changing experience to listen to these amazing mujeres highlight their powerful and soulful journeys. Encuentras your voice, amigas. Put it in writing. Step into your truth, ladies. Ciao. Really appreciate the time you take to rate and review the podcast. Get the backstory and what you've heard here today and reach out on our website at lifelinks.com. That's L N double X. Because it's about time, it's about us. Stay in the groove on our social media at lifelinks and get ready to make your move, ladies. Viva!